So hello everyone and welcome to the 2021 Global Animal Disaster Management Conference. I'm Mel Taylor, one of the organising committees and it's great to have you here today. Um, today our session is going to be given by Dr Sinner and his presentation is going to be uh, Managing Animal Disasters in Developing Countries, a Livelihood Perspective. We're very, very happy to have Dr Sinha with us today. If you're interested to read more about the presentation or about him, please go to the speakers section in our web, on our website and you can find the abstracts and bios there. Um, I have a few housekeeping points to make before we begin. You'll find that the Zoom chat feature has been disabled, so please, if you have some questions, please write those in the Q&A section and we'll get to those at the end of the presentation. We'd also like to encourage you to use the hashtag GADMConf if you're on Twitter or on other social media. And at the end of the presentation, as you leave, there will be an evaluation of the present, uh, presentation and session. So please fill that out for us. And just a reminder, we are recording the sessions. We will be editing these and making them available in, Ju in July when we also have the um, release of the Australian Journal of Emergency Management that goes alongside the conference. So without further delay, I'd now like to introduce Dr. Sinner to give his presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Taylor. Rebecca, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's an indeed an honor to be in communication with the global community, especially in a dire times of disaster, pandemics. Uh, before I go to the core subject of my presentation, I would like to just make two uh, disclaimers. First, my presentation is certainly not a scholarly one. It's a kind of uh, exploration of policy perspective in the field of uh, animals, especially in current circumstances. Secondly, though I'm being a government servant, uh, my presentation may reflect my personal views, personal and professional views, uh, not um, uh, exactly the official of, uh, stand of government of India. Uh, with this little two disclaimers, uh, now I come to the topic of my presentation as you, you see that uh, managing animal disasters in developing uh, countries take a different perspective uh, from our developed nations uh, though uh, developed nations have the infrastructures capital means and a large section of uh, markets also yet the majority of production bases are uh, confined to the uh, developing countries Agrarian economies, mostly being a primary sector, uh, stand confined to developing nations. So we try to uh, look into those issues, which particularly uh, concerns developing economies. As I said earlier, that my, it's not in a scholarly presentation. Uh, it is just for policy perspective exploration. So I'll keep my talking points confined to four uh, major issues. Uh, disaster and economies, then livelihood paradigms uh, across the world, then contemporary issues which are uh, taking uh, the center for of policy deliberations, uh, program formulations and implementations, and finally the road ahead. So I'll try to confine my uh, discussions. Uh, I'll not model presentation exactly. It's kind of discussion issues. Uh, I would appreciate uh, larger participation from the audience with discussion and question and answers. As uh, in course of discussion, we may come across so many other uh, parallel thinkings or lateral thinkings uh, that may give some uh, leeway in uh, devising our future course of action. Uh, as uh, we all know that whenever there is any kind of disaster, whether it's natural or man-made, uh, besides affecting human or animal life, it really impacts, its long-term impact is felt in the field of economies. Uh, it is an uh, approximate estimation that around 2% of global GDP is annually lost in various kinds of disasters. But of late, uh, as the economies grows further, this net, uh, uh, net amount of this uh, GDP also keeps on increasing. Uh, for developed nations, uh, this 2% uh, may not figure that prominently. However, in a developing economies, this 2% constitute a larger portion of their uh, economic uh, progresses 
and uh, any dent into that takes away years of uh, developmental activities. Obviously, the worst impact of any disasters is felt in the developing economies because there are so many structural inequalities and weaknesses uh, that uh, do away with the redundancy, whatever we try to build upon ES through developmental activities. So the developing economies be the worst uh, brunt of uh, disasters. Especially in developing economies, uh, besides human uh, life and health, uh, the livelihood sector is, sector is uh, uh, takes the secondary hit. Reason being, uh, there is overpopulation, lack of opportunities, and a kind of uh, uh, unequal distribution of uh, uh, opportunities as well. And these unequal, uh, this uh, socio-economic disparities. Uh, also have a predominant role in deciding uh, opportunities to the livelihood. Uh, developing economies are characterized by preponderance, preponderance of agrarian economies. Most of the job, labors, and uh, uh, livelihood activities are confined to the agriculture sectors, feed, crop production, or uh, animal uh, husbandry. Due to this uh, disasters, uh, as a, a serious consequence in long-term effect is felt in the uh, economic disparity which keeps on increasing. Uh, though we try to uh, bring these disparities through social uh, political reforms, government initiatives to build up some developmental uh, 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 recovery pathway, yet it uh, end, ends up with uh, increasing the economic disparities between the societies. In developing economies, uh, one of the weakest uh, uh, handicap, one of the strongest handicap uh, we face is that uh, our economic opportunities are largely determined by your social standing. And uh, the countries with uh, diverse population from caste, creed, religions have unequal access to the livelihood opportunities. Uh, then coming to the uh, uh, second last is that these in long term uh, in developing economies, uh, a very adverse effect is visible in the field of gender gaps. Most of the animal production based uh, are co uh, contributed by female, uh, females also, and especially in developing economies. Those are already stressed with the running day-to-day uh, -day economic uh, activities of the society and the households. But during disasters, these stress increases many fold, thereby uh, decreases the uh, opportunities of livelihood to the female at the same time, increasing the cost of production, increasing the social cost of production on the female as well. As per the uh, World Bank report, it has been estimated that after uh, post pandemic, uh, the global economies are likely to shrink by almost 5.2%. Though uh, this 5.2% is a general calculation across uh, spread across various societies of various countries, geographic boundaries and uh, economies. Yet it has been observed that the initial uh, effect will be felt more in the developed economics because uh, the social restrictions, the physical distancing and the um, lockdowns and other social restrictions and uh, medical measures has taken away a big hit on the uh, uh, service sectors uh, which uh, somehow uh, stands in the structural uh, aspect of our economies. But its long-term effect would be failed in the developing economies because uh, the developed nations uh, takes more, most of their raw materials, whether it's uh, raw materials, means of productions, and produces uh, from developing economies. So its long-term effect is likely to impact the developing economies. If you take a overview of the existing uh, livelihood paradigms across the world, what we find that in developing economies, especially it is confined to the agrarian sectors. As I told you, it's crop, it's uh, fish farming, it's animal husbandry, and horticulture. And these sectors are labor intensive. Uh, being poor uh, developing countries don't have that uh, economic uh, uh, infrastructures 
or economic support to go in for capital intensive uh, type of development so by default the labor intensive uh, takes their predominant form of uh, livelihood paradigms as i mentioned earlier inequalities of opportunities are there and these are uh, structural as well as non structural in non structural sense i mean that the society is so diverse uh, with their politi uh, political religious and social perspective that uh, has a bearing on deciding the livelihood kind of livelihood the scale of livelihood and means of livelihood they can take upon uh, for example pig farming could be good in some economies but may not be good in other economies for various uh, socio religious uh, reasons dairy production at the same time beef production these two again can have its uh, can have some socio religious overtones that may decides its access to the economies so there exists a larger gap of uh, uh, inequality of opportunities and there also exist lack of structural support uh, since uh, these being completely in uh, unorganized sectors in developed economies these are in organized sectors dairy farming pig farming poultry farming and beef farming but in case of uh, developing economies these are completely uh, backyards and a kind of subsidence kind of uh, animal husbandry and that requires uh, that always uh, lack of uh, structural support from the government agencies are there so these four uh, pillars of uh, livelihood in uh, developing economies somehow constitute our uh, handicap as well now coming to the contemporary issues though these were long standing issues uh, under the sustainability development and um, quest we've been uh, trying to address but in 2020 the uh, advent of uh, covid 19 pandemic has changed the context altogether earlier uh, it was considered an after effect of any immediate uh, disaster with localized effect with some localized impact on the society as well as the country but this covid 19 pandemic has spread world across and it has affected adversely each and every economy whether it is developed developing or least developed so this uh, contemporary context transcends all barriers across geographies across societies across political systems the worst hit has been observed in the disruption in global supply chain due to uh, restrictions the markets markets has shrunk there is no movement of man material there is little supply of food especially animal husbandry based products across the globe for obvious reason of infection containment as a consequence of this uh, pandemic disruption uh, in global supply chain due to some political reason market restrictions is also being observed across the uh, world countries having imposed very tough phytosanitary measures have put restrictions on the import or export of animal based product and that is taking a very adverse consequences on third uh, on developing economies as of late uh, in last decade a majority of uh, progress has been observed in the field of an animal based products uh, exports being the fish dairy other other products lack of job opportunities lack of livelihood and lack of market has also resulted into rising inflation that has been witnessed all world across here a distinction lies that since the big economies developed economies have good uh, capital backup good uh, strong financial support system so for them recovery from this pandemic uh may be difficult 
but not very distant. But for developing economies, which so far has been sustaining their economies by uh, external borrowings, by local market borrowings, by mobilizing hard resources, they are facing uh, real grave consequences on the monetary front. Lack of supply and lack of job opportunities is resulting into rising inflation, be it the price of essential commodities, petroleums, or other livelihood, uh, other uh, life saving drugs, etc. This contemporary uh, COVID pandemic has also aggravated the situation of food insecurity. Under the auspices of UN, We've been chasing the dream of food security by 2030 World Cross to eliminate the hunger. But it has been estimated that this pandemic has dented badly our efforts so far. Some of the countries are also witnessing political instability due to their inability to rise up to the people's expectations to provide essential life-saving uh, life drugs, daily uh, use items, and other kind of uh, social support. So this will have consequences in the political arena also. Countries around the world are seeing it in case of increasing civil strife, migrations, post-migrations, illegal migrations, and these are the contemporary issues that is going to have a very profound overhang on the future course of animal disaster management as these invariably have direct bearing on animal humor interface. I would like to make a special highlight on the food insecurity front because in developing economies most of the governmental or structural efforts goes into making uh, livelihood, life of people secure by providing the means of opportunities as well as uh, uh, livelihood opportunities as well as uh, good nutrition. It has been estimated that almost 690 million people went hungry around in 2019. That has absolute increase of almost 10 million people over 2018 figures. But the contemporary calculation suggests that COVID-19 pandemic is likely to push another 83 million people, totaling to 132 million people in the chronic hunger index in 2020. And that is a big figure. And it is likely to push for uh, our uh, agenda for food security beyond 2030. Amidst all these kind of contemporary issues emerging pandemic threats, disaster happening world across, increasing incidence of disasters to a largely precipitated by climate change. Today, the developing economies are facing a big development predicament. And these are life versus livelihood. In the initial of stages of uh, societal development, obviously life figures, but after a threshold, livelihood becomes equally important because people may survive a disaster, but this survival may not be a sustainable one if livelihood is not secured. So, there is a predicament between life versus livelihood. The Sendai framework has given a very broad uh, agenda on the protection of livelihood framework as well. It highlighted that besides saving life, livelihood is equally important. Another development is another predicament is develop versus developing economies. There are certain structural uh, restructuring that may be warranted 
to keep these two economies interlinked. Developed countries mostly service based, high uh, capital intensive economies. They have a different uh, different kind of uh, economic paradigm. Where, but developing economies largely depends on agrarian and primary sectors. So a uh, connection with uh, a choice between primary versus secondary and tertiary economies uh, is there. When we're trying to roll out from this global disaster, the two important considerations also comes that it is local versus global. Though the world today stands together on a single platform to survive as a humanity, to overcome this pandemic, yet while rolling back our economies, local factor may play predominant roles. As there are restrictions of movement, of people, goods. So in initial phases of a recovery, countries and societies may have to focus on local means. Here in India, our Prime Minister has also given a clarion call of vocal for local. And that is the only means we can safeguard our primary economies, our primary producers, especially in the environment sectors. Now coming to the road ahead. What lies in the future? How we are going to overcome? The Sendai framework has given a very uh, apt directive for the future. That is to build back better. better. Disaster is kind of uh, inevitable consequ uh, inevitable uh, consequences, but by preparedness, by awareness generations, and by restructuring our society, we can minimize its adverse impact and try to build some kind of resilience into the system that stands on the principle of build back better. This building back better could be structural as well as non-structural. On a structural front, the government is there, political system is there to inbuilt resilience in all developmental activities while planning, while financing, and while executing their policies. Insurance of animal energy sector, provision of secured means of logistic support, transportations, in international trade, capital investments. These are the structural means the government and political system can look into. In non-structural front, as part of society, we have to look into those habits, our social norms that can minimize the impact of disasters on animal husbandry sector. So it's a kind of collective effort between structural and non-structural uh, stakeholders. The obvious route to the future lies in sustainable livelihood. Whatever future means of production we try to build upon, we'll have to see that it is sustainable. It is resilient to the consequences of disaster. And how this can be done? Again, here is a predicament between top down to bottom up. A sustainable livelihood definitely may have some political overhang from top down. But to ensure sustainability in the system, invariably we'll have to follow upon bottom up approach. Because it's the local community that knows the best course of their means of production, their handicaps, their market outlets, their uh, socio-economic capital cost into this. So sustainable livelihood has to be there. Coming to the sustainable livelihood, I would like to make mention that since our 
inception on this planet humanity has always struggled for survival at the cost of other living world i mean animals our relations over with animals have changed drastically post industrialization earlier where life uh, livestock and animals used to be a part of our socio economic existence but today it capital intensive production system has rendered this into a kind of uh, product consumer uh, uh, oriented product but this human animal relationship has to be reexamined in current context of pandemics this is time we again have to think what form of animal sanctuary we look in for do we still afford the capital intensive animal farming or we fall back to the classical model of labor intensive one keeping people's livelihood in mind we also have to take care of our environment cause lot many threats lot many uh, disasters are coming from the our near environment is as well our thirst for development our hunger for progress has taken a bad toll on the our environment our surroundings and its uh, ill consequences are evident all across it's time we reexamine our development developmental priorities in context of environmental protection also particularly this pandemic has bring forth a point of emerging threats from animal world we know most of the zoonotic diseases comes from animals human animal conflict is increasing day by day viruses bacteria and other pathogens are jumping species and there is li and there is hardly any likely remission in near future it's also time to examine how we deal with our wildlife how we deal with our flora and fauna because increasing exposure to human kind is also increasing opportunities for cross species infections increasing exploitations of forest increasing poaching of wildlife is also invariably bringing us in contact with zoonotic diseases whatever happened in wuhan could be seen as a normal transmission of zoonotic virus from animal to human being but when we examine in global context we have had ebola also we have had bird flu and these all viruses are now very much in societal contact they are into the human population but we are completely unaware of their progression in our society their progression in our a living world it's time the future planning of disaster management should also take a recourse on examining issues on the human animal interface the world health initiative is a right platform to take this forward as sitting collectively together we can decide how we are going to check it how we are going to contain it and how we are going to safeguard our animals winery based livelihood system be it developed countries or developing countries from the increasing vagaries of nature with this little uh, policy perspective overview uh, i thank you once again gdmc to give me this opportunities to be in connect with global community Uh, especially the time of pandemic it's a very uh, special initiative 
to maintain continuity continuity among the veterinary professionals and others thank you very much thank you so much dr sinner for um for your for your presentation you have spoken about some very profound and important issues um and and you have summed them up very nicely in terms of of their uh, significance both in india and to and more globally so thank you so much um we have a, f a couple of questions here for you if you're happy to answer some questions for us okay. um, so we have a question here from nidhi who thanks you for your presentation um and says um that you've raised issues around the loss of livelihood in the form of animals. Um, if livelihood is so dependent on animals, then are there any clauses mentioned in the disaster management protocol to provide financial support to the affected animal owners? Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Nidhi. Thank you for, for your compliments. Uh, see, uh, as I said, yeah, definitely animals, uh, when animals are infected, so is the livelihood. Uh, Speaking in context of Government of India, uh, we have been providing uh, financial assistance to the farmers, be it dairy farmers, poultry farmers. Recently, we had a bout of uh, uh, outbreak of uh, bird flu across the country, where we were forced to uh, cull the poultry, thereby the economies of the uh, farmers were badly affected, who has invested their hard-earned money to that. but their losses were adequately compensated by the government of India by giving them financial assistance. Not only this, uh, whenever there is any kind of disaster, uh, after doing post-disaster analysis, after assessment of damages being caused, the Ministry of Agriculture invariably uh, try to compensate farmers through giving some monetary incentive by ensuring uh, their future means of production and by providing a cheap or interest-free loan also to restart their livelihood. I hope this satisfies your answers. Okay. Thank you. Um, can I ask one question of my own? Um, in, in the Australian context, we talk a lot about responsibility. Uh, we have responsibility for animals in disasters lies with the owner of the animal, the person in charge or guardianship of the animal. Is that, is that the same in, in this sort of context you're talking about? Is the, the local owner of the animal um, expected to be the one responsible for thinking about these things and planning and, and trying to reduce the likely impact of a disaster on, on themselves? Uh, Ms. Tiller, in uh, here in context with India, the ownership of uh, animals, uh, though, uh, though considered as uh, an issue to uh, be taken up of the government, yet most of the means of uh, animal-based production system lies in a uh, non-structural sector of society. And in uh, non-structural society, uh, there is no means of uh, registration or there is no means of uh, ascertaining the ownership of animal. But in case of organized uh, farms, organized uh, animal husbandry system, it is there. And by means of insurance, by means of uh, uh, registration with the uh, financing, authority, financing agencies and uh, insuring agencies also, uh, these indirect ownership of animals are there. But on a larger scale, in a public domain, uh, there is no mechanism except for the pits in few cities and municipalities. Uh, it is still lacking. Okay. Um, I have one other person here who's just asking about whether you could give us some examples or observations where um, gender or caste economic disparity, disparities have been made worse um, during the pandemic in farming and agriculture and food security um, and the way in which those sorts of things unfold. Have, do you have any examples or observations? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's a very, uh, uh, one very uh, strong handicap of developing economies that uh, our, all economic activities are predominantly dependent upon our 
socio-economic standings. Uh, in our context, uh, like I uh, give an example of vegetable growing in India. Uh, the vegetable growing in India is, is confined to few sections of the societies and who has since ages been into the business of vegetable growing and farming and producing. However, uh, in last decade there has been some changes but still uh, that farming is considered uh, their uh, societal uh, preserve. And this section of society is not very uh, economically very strong. So in case of disaster, uh, sustainability become a very big op challenge for them because they have very little means of production with them. They don't have much of the land holdings. They don't have much of the capital assets with them. So as such, that particular uh, caste of society faces the brunt of disaster. In LMS Bintry, like I'll give you an example. Uh, the pig farming is not very much popular with one particular set of religion. So any society uh, that is not into that uh, kind of farming have some kind of uh, resilience inbuilt because their life does not directly depend upon them. But at the same time, the same religious community is into the business of butchery and meat production. So once this kind of disasters uh, transcend and get, gets into that production um, chain, then that community get indirect impact of the same. So uh, that particular religious community may not participate in pig farming, but while taking carrying out their meat business, they'll fit the, feel the pinch. So it's a kind of uh, handicap we have in this uh, developing economies. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, this, I think this whole idea of um, systems within systems, you know, the inter interdependencies we have within, within livestock farming, within One Health, it doesn't matter what area you're in, there's, there's so much there to work together. So um, oh, I'll just have one more question actually just popped up. So I will ask that one if that's okay. Um, Please. So Jodie says, asks, with reference to mass culling um, food production animals and uh, disaster situations, has any consideration been given to the possibility of implementing a form of preserving storage or processing of carcasses for consumer use? Is there a way to, um, to avoid, or avoid the complete loss of, of that protein in the food chain? Uh, technically, this makes sense. But uh, carcasses, again, it considers a health hazard in any disasters. Uh, at that time, the governance issue comes into for safe disposal of carcasses. Salvage could be an option, but uh, considering in totality its other uh, adverse consequences, uh, this sounds a bit improbable in current context. Though on some of organized farms, organized sectors, this can be taken up, where they have so many means of rendering it uh, they have means of extracting protein and other salaries of carcass that can be done. But uh, in developing economies, due to lack of infrastructure, lack of cap, uh, uh, technologies and lack of uh, political support as well, uh, this sounds a little bit improbable. Mm. Yeah, no, fair enough. Okay, well, thank you so much, Dr. Sinner. I think we'll leave the presentation there. Um, thank you for your contribution to the conference. Uh, attendees, our next session will be in three and a half hours time. We've got Ian Douglas coming from Vets Beyond Borders to talk about um, veterinary emergency management um, uh, in that area. So um, please join us back then. And uh, you may have seen in your inboxes that we've had um, information about the virtual social um, event we've got going, the trivia and, and virtual cafe. So if you're interested in that, please register. Um, so we can send you the link um, for tomorrow for, for the afternoon. Okay, thank you so much um, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you.